Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome you here in this hall number two, which is going to deal with supply chain and uh, will deal with uh, sustainability in a special way. Um, I think that first of all, may I give you some technical uh, comments on how we are going to uh, perform this uh, morning session. First of all, may I ask you to turn off your mobile or silence it a little bit. Uh, then uh, we shall have five speakers uh, around me in the panel who will uh, uh, share with you their experiences from the practical point of view, how they see the specific issue of the supply chain. and. Uh, we are going to do it in two parts. Each and every speaker will have about five minutes to introduce the subject from their point of view. And then uh, uh, I will uh, give, since I would like to encourage an interactive type of uh, discussion between the audience and the panelists, I will give the floor to the audience to put questions or to make comments. In order to avoid any additional keynote speakers to be involved in the exercise. Those who are making comments from the audience, may I ask you to keep it as short as it is possible, but certainly not longer than two minutes. I will be uh, tough on this and I will uh, watch my, uh, I keep an eye on my watch to, to control the time. 
Um, supply chain is a rather special expression and a rather special uh, issue to deal with. And uh, since there is another uh, session in parallel with this specific one, which is dealing with aviation, uh, no wonder I think that uh, aviation is at the moment probably more sexy than the supply chain issue. But supply chain is a long lasting uh, exercise uh, with visions involved and with ideas involved. Why today aviation is basically concentrating on short term solutions most of the time, how to avoid, for example, the volcanic ash. We don't have such a problem in the supply chain for the time being except for uh, that part of the transportation which is dealt with by the aviation itself. But uh, certainly supply chain represents a serious benefit and a serious dilemma. Serious benefit is that if the supply chain is extremely efficient and it involves uh, transportation activities and it involves also logistics activities, we can say that a huge part of the European GDP is produced by those who are participating in the supply chain activity. Uh, on the other hand, we know that transport is considered to be one of the most polluting activities in the economy. And uh, supply chain with the approach of uh, efficiency and supply chain with the approach of sustainability, oftentimes these uh, targets are clashing with each other. So we have to find a compromise. We have to find common ways how to encourage the proper use of supply chain. Supply chain means of course, you are experts. Most of you are experts sitting in the, in the room, but uh, supply chains, chain means all the activities and all the actors who are involved in a process where uh, a product from its uh, manufacturing point reaches the final uh, customer, the final user of this product somewhere, somewhere else in the world. Supply chain involves not only European issues, but it involves also global considerations. And some of our speakers who are going to tell us their experience uh, are dealing with global activities. Uh, fortunately, and I am really grateful for the Secretariat that they managed to invite uh, those people who are now sitting around me, they managed to invite those people who have uh, a uh, big overview, not only on their own sectors, but also on the environment around them. So they can make comparison between the different solutions of theirs. They can make decisions, business decisions, with a view on the environment around themselves uh, from the point of the business and from, from the point of other aspects. I came from the European Commission, which has a slightly different function that the lady and the gentleman are having here. The European Commission intends to represent uh, those views and those values which are considered to be European. And sometimes we have to act as governments. And uh, those people around me who are representing their companies, they are representing the interest of the private sector at the same time. So it will be very interesting to hear their comments on how, what role the government can play in the supply chain regulation and in the encouragement of uh, having more efficient and sustainable supply chain system in place. And at the same time, I think it will be interesting to hear their recommendations. Where do they see uh, potential invo involvement of the private sector in much uh, more efficient way in the decision-making processes carried out by both the European 
institutions and the national government. Our first speaker is going to be Mr. Declan Sapul, uh, who represents the Accenture, this uh, well-known uh, organization, and his special field is supply chain, no wonder. So, uh, Declan, I would pass the floor to you uh, with reminding you of the time frame. Thank you very much, Sultan. Is the microphone working? Yeah, okay. So let me start by saying that um, I believe, or Accenture also believes, that carbon management and sustainability is uh, more than just a requirement. I think it uh, poses a significant business opportunity and is also now a core component of strategies that really drive high performance in the world of supply chain management. Um, so uh, the role that I have in Accenture is to consult companies on, in the area of supply chain management and to tell them, well, how do I address uh, green supply chains, uh, sustainability, and still make money at the end of the day as well? Um, we did a research uh, recently as well on the topic of uh, what we call supply chain mastery. And interestingly, uh, what uh, we've found is that there is a definite correlation between cost reduction uh, efficiency and uh, an increased focus on sustainability because typically what we have found is that uh, what we call supply chain masters are those companies that have outperformed their peers over a period of time in terms of return on invested capital um, have uh, implemented efficient supply chains they have improved uh, the processes not only from production but all the, going all the way back into the procurement cycle so looking at sustainable procurement practices looking at uh, low-cost country sourcing, the um, a focus on combining inbound and outbound transportation practices, raising the efficiency levels of transportation and a movement of stock across the end-to-end -end supply chain. And those companies that have outperformed their peers have, uh, in terms of statistics, we found managed to decrease logistics and transportation costs by 2%, have reduced their energy costs by, on average, around 6%, and have also reduced the cost of operations and facilities by a couple of percentage points. So the point that I'm trying to make is that in, t in, in this focus on sustainability, on green supply chain, it is very important to have an end-to-end -end focus on your supply chain within the organization, from procurement all the way through to customer service, sales and marketing, and after sales support and service management. It can't it can't be addressed in a chaotic manner. So what we need here is a structure and a systematic approach, which leads me then on to the next topic, and is probably one which Sean may touch on as well later on, and which we've worked with together with the World Economic Forum on, is the topic of how do I measure my carbon impact? How do I measure the footprint, and do I have the data at all to be able to uh, tell whether I'm doing a good job or not? So it has to be based on fact-based analytics. And of course, as any solution uh, and any configuration of my supply chain needs to be, it needs to be scalable and it needs to be cost effective. Um, just one example in looking at that end-to-end -end supply chain, uh, uh, an example which a colleague uh, of mine told me recently as well, is that if you look at the, the supply chain for tea bags, for example, and you look at the manufacturer from the sourcing of the tea leaves, the manufacturing of the tea bag themselves, the packaging, the production process, um, it is a product which may come from India, for example, be packaged, put in containers, and shipped them to different regions around the world. How can you look at improving the carbon footprint or reducing the carbon footprint from that supply chain? And the analysis that we did showed that there are several different areas, transport, of course, being one of them, the production process itself being another major element. But then, interestingly enough, the uh, entire supply chain is completely belittled by the consumption act at the end of the supply chain. And I think what we need to do is we need to raise the level of awareness in, at the consumer as well and uh, make it completely apparent that by turning on a kettle and boiling the water, I am using a, 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 a much, much higher level of energy to brew that one cup of tea than has been used for that supply chain for that tea bag along the whole case. So I think what we need to do is we need to expand our horizons here. Some of the areas, and I think I've touched on one or two of them, where I would and where Accenture recommends that we need to delve into more detail on, for example, the area of packaging. Uh, if you look at the, um, the reduce, reuse, and recycle mantra, basically, around the area of, re of, of packaging, uh, we should be looking at um, 
the reduction of packaging quantities and the design of packaging should be uh, strong, more strongly focused on the environment. We should try to reuse packaging as much as possible. This is valid not only for the consumer packaging, but also for the outer packaging and for pallets, for multi-use pallets um, throughout the supply chain. And we should try to increase the use of recycling of packaging as well. For example, waste collection and distribution centers in the production and uh, increase the collaboration basically across all of the different elements of the supply chain. Um, carbon labels is another big area I think which is gaining in, uh, uh, in attention at the moment and there have been multi multiple events or uh, multiple companies have already focused on labeling their products. I think Boots in the UK was one strong example but how do we then basically increase the awareness of the consumer as I mentioned before uh, and consider what the true cost of sustainability is. Um, there was an interesting reference made inside by uh, Sue who uh, mentioned this idea of intermodal passenger transport and she was looking at the red dots in Washington and uh, recognized that there are many different handover points and multiple supply elements of the transport uh, supply chain of the transport chain basically already in place. The same is also, of course, true for, the tra for freight transport and for the freight supply chain. So uh, the whole concept of intermodal supply chain design, moving from truck to sea to air, uh, and the development of uh, hubs such as, I believe, in, uh, in London, the London Gateway example, which is a large project that is being triggered there at the moment, are uh, innovative thinking ideas in that area too. So um, last but not least, um, I'll mention one other area, and that is the area of innovative fuel technologies. Uh, of course, there are many different um, alternative fuels that are available, and uh, the technologies that can be used are, is also the subject of a study that we did uh, last year, the um, disruptive technologies in transport fuels. And what we did there was we analyzed uh, different technologies in moving to different alternative fuel sources. Uh, those that are evolutionary in type, those that are revolutionary, and those that are complete game-changing. So examples of the evolutionary type uh, of technologies would be, for example, next generation internal combustion engines. Uh, we mentioned the advances in diesel engines inside. Uh, revolutionary would maybe be the use of butanol or bio-crude fuels or algae, uh, for example, as a feedstock source as well for um, uh, new fuel, uh, biofuel sources and game changing are those topics that were mentioned also by, by Mr. Lee inside from BY, uh, BYD um, uh, the area of electrification or the electric engine um, with hybrid electric vehicles really being something that we consider to be a game changing technology in the next 10 to 15 years. Overall as I close um, maybe let me just say that I think um, it is extremely important then for businesses to be able to combine financial benefit with an increase in expectation uh, from their customers in service levels that are to be achieved. So balancing cost and service remains a challenge, but business cases now are able to introduce the third dimension of sustainability and come out with a posit positive business case for uh, investments in new supply chains. Thank you, Declan. <clears throat> uh, it was an interesting reference to the intermodal passenger transport issue in your speech because there will be a speaker who will address this issue later on in more details. Uh, but it is true that supply chain should involve passenger transport in a way. Um, the next speaker, Mr. Enno Singa, is going to be... Uh, uh, the one who, is represent, who, who came from a rather specific sector, which is aviation. He deals with uh, cargo issues in the Schiphol Airport. And uh, uh, he had already a couple of questions concerning supply chain, the gist of supply chain. First of all, and this is a typical approach from a business-like uh, attitude, uh, who is the owner of the benefits if there is a development in the supply chain? Uh, actually, who is going to pay for it? And how can we measure the uh, return on the costs 
which is paid on the actual supply chain development. So, uh, Anno, I would pass the floor to you. Please uh, express your opinion on this, and I hope that this is going to generate also some additional questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, Zoltan, and you're right. I'm from the aviation industry, which is very sexy, but I'm very happy to be here because, in essence, in the supply chain, I believe, is where we're going to really make the gains. Let me take you through a real, uh, the, the history or the case as we approach this in the Netherlands. And it really started in 2006 with the installation of an independent advisory board. The Minister of Transport at the time installed this board and they had a very clear mission, um, innovation in logistics, but focus on jobs and value creation. You don't hear sustainability. Quite frankly, sustainability was a given. But to do sustainability for the sake of sustainability wasn't fitting in our mission. Somewhere it had to be paid for. So the focus was look at development, but focus on added value and, uh, and jobs. And the commission was built up from representatives from the industry, from the government, from consultancy, and from science. And as such, it was a strong force in building a bridge between industry and government in getting things implemented. The result, and I'm taking you in a big jump through two years of discussions and study, but the result was that we identified four key areas. One was cross-chain control centers, really having to do with inner distribution and making sure that we get all the supply chains of the different users together and optimized. The second focus was on service logistics, not surprisingly for the Netherlands because that's what the Netherlands is all about. And it's not just about physically moving the goods, but it's very much about the management and the direction of it, which we believe is our unique uh, uh, capability that we have. The third one is main ports in control. Remember, we have the Port of Rotterdam, the Port of Amsterdam, and Schiphol Airport as three main ports, and we were looking at ways they could control the issues. And the third one was uh, Dynalog, the Dutch Institute of Advanced Logistics. Um, we felt that if you really want to build this and if you really want to strongly develop this, you need a, an academic source or really a source that's a link between the academic world and the business world, and we started Dynalog. It was decided and started a year ago. It's already fully operational. In fact, I think they're out there displaying themselves. And that's where all the innovation in the Netherlands is now funneled through. That could not have been possible without a very strong government commitment. The total cost of the project we proposed out of the Advisory Council were 67 million euros. The government, both the Ministry of Economic Affairs and the Ministry of Transport together supplied 25 million in a matching fund. So they really made it possible for us to start up this institution and to start the process working. The expected benefit, by the way, is if you're looking, you know, why do you spend this money? The expected benefit is somewhere between 8 and 15 billion euros. I'm talking 2020, but we're talking about a tripling of the total added value of logistics to the Netherlands. Now, going back to one of the projects that I was strongly involved in, that's main port in control. We did not look at technology. There's an awful lot of technological innovation in individual parts of the chain. We just looked at the total chain and see how can it come together. And one of the questions that already came up, when you say logistic chain, who owns it? And the difficulty is nobody owns the whole chain. At least nobody owns it to the effect that they're willing to start managing it and shipping it or, or, or improving it. The shippers, you could say, own the chain, but tell me which actual manufacturing company has a logistics director in their main board. It's one of the things they have to do. So that's not going to work. But what we felt is as main ports, because as a an port and as an airport, you don't physically do anything in the process, but all you do is manage the process and bring parties together. So we felt it could be and should be our role to improve that. And we started looking at possibilities of, of coordinating information flows, infrastructure, road infrastructure, and improving the network. And out of that, we get some very, very clear business results. We achieved clear, better utilization of vehicles. I don't know whether you know, but currently the actual load factor of trucks on our European road network is probably only 50%, 5-0%. So half of it is empty, that's space that's there. Lower transportation cost. If you can improve that load factor, you take the cars off the road, you lower your cost. 
You can improve your reliability if you have a good information system, and you can certainly make better use of the infrastructure, because on the whole, we have enough infrastructure when it comes to roads. It would be okay if we didn't all want to use these same roads at the same time on Monday morning between 7 and 9, and Friday afternoon between 5 and 9. So what do we build on information? We linked the different information systems from the ports, and we're going to link the next phase of the airport information system. Not in terms of flight movements, no, we'll link the information on actual shipments arriving when and where, where do they have to be, what's their final destination, and what's their whole routing, because that way we can optimize it. We do that together, by the way, with our customs, with security, so it's totally integrated. Infrastructure. At the ports, we're very much looking at improvement for slot management. How can you optimize your road structure if you're able to, to allocate slots to certain truck movements? However, you can only do that if you have that full information on the actual traffic flows, you know what's being transported. And then on the network, the key message is create inland forward hubs. Get the traffic, get the goods away from the ports, get it out of there, but get it out of there, not at rush hour, but get it out of there at the time nobody drives. Get it out of there on Saturday night. Get it out of there any night, as long as it's not at rush hour. And then create an inland forward hub, combined of all the ports where the goods are being moved to, as close to the border as the final destination is. If it needs to go to Poland, put it somewhere in the east or the middle of the east of the Netherlands. Have to go to Italy, put it in the south. And these, these multimodal, because they have to be multimodal hubs, need to be reached by rail, inland waterway, and truck. And what you can then do is create shuttle services off-peak between the ports and these forward hubs. And because they're shuttle services, they have a 100% load factor. And because the shuttle services, because, you know, the reality is at an airport, Everything is flown in on Saturday, and all the trucks arrive on Monday morning to pick it up. Nobody wants to pick up their goods on the Sunday. So let's move Sunday to get it out of the concentration. And that way, we improve traffic flows. We take traffic off the road. We reduce congestion. We significantly reduce sustainability, and we facilitate cross-border traffic. Now, as we said, the challenge is, you know, who is the owner? Who's going to make it work? Who benefits? It's interesting when you talk about this idea to trucking companies, trucking companies said, we don't like that idea because our business is trucking. And what you're doing is create less trucking. So they're not the beneficiaries. The shippers, yes, they are, but in a long way away. So this is one of the challenges. Provide information platforms that combine all the information. Right. Who owns the platform? Who's going to manage the platform? Who's going to distribute the information? And secondly, in order to make this happen, you need to pre-finance. Industry will come up with the finance, but sometimes you need to pre-finance. How do you link the cost that maybe the pre-financing, therefore the government needs to make, to the benefits that are going to come out along later? These are challenges that we're facing, but I think the key thing that we heard this morning, challenges are fine, but we're going to solve them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, uh, you started to raise a few things which uh, certainly we have to deal with in more details uh, during the course of the next couple of minutes. Uh, when we talk about uh, supply chain, uh, we of course mean uh, hubs, uh, the works at the hubs to be organized properly and coordinated properly, but we uh, at the same time should not forget about the means of transport between the different hubs. Uh, and uh, here, uh, I just would like to refer to the co-modality principle, which is a slightly different one from the intermodality approach which we had earlier. Uh, we want to take the best out of each and every mode of transportation, the probably most efficient way. And uh, uh, then, of course, the distribution of the costs and the distribution of the benefits is something which we have to settle in advance. Uh, the first two speakers addressed several issues which uh, may have generated some questions in you. So I would encourage the audience now to make comments or to put questions. And since uh, uh, I don't see too well from the uh, light, uh, please indicate uh, your intention to the closest person who has a mobile micro. And may I ask you to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Henrik Kubitsky from Aberdeen University, and um, I'd like to ask, um, 
Um, we heard in the first panel that we need a paradigm shift, but I mean, to be quite frankly, or frankly speaking, I think what we talk about now is rather a paradigm adjustment than a paradigm shift. And isn't it time to face the con consumer and the customer that, I mean, actually, transports are far too cheap and we, we need to change this paradigm that, you know, it's, it's, it's just too cheap produced right now. And um, I think that's, that's you know, you, you can't produce with green energy or uh, biofuels in the same way with, you know, without uh, abusing or exploring the, the, the environment. And so I think, you know, we need to face the con consumer with this fact. Thanks. Could uh, we regard it as a question or a comment, rather? Yeah. It's a whom to address it? No, no, I think uh, in the beginning, uh, Mr. Declan Sapel mentioned that um, oh. we have the opportunities of, of new f uh, fuels, the biofuels, and, and, and that we can uh, increase efficiency and stuff. But I think it, it's not about increasing and adjusting uh, the paradigm we're, we're stuck in right now. It's rather trying to shift the paradigm. And I think that's not what we do right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I can okay. one. If the microphone is working, does it work? Yeah, I'll try it now. So I completely agree um, on the need for a um, a shift in focus. Basically, this is what I tried to allude to as well with the um, the introduction of uh, increasing the awareness on the side of the consumer. So the tea bag example or a shampoo example, if you want to take that one. You know, as soon as I uh, I use the product, basically I have uh, I'm basically creating a cost that I'm not aware of at the moment as well. So I completely agree that there is a, a, a complete need for the paradigm shift here. The reference that I made as well to new fuel technologies and so on is uh, something that we try to analyze in terms of what are the, um, what are the costs associated, what is the time frame associated, what are the challenges associated with these different technologies that, are aware, that we're aware of at the moment. And we try to basically cluster them into areas where we say, well, these are ones that we would bet on today. And I completely agree with you that we need this paradigm shift. And for me, that's a move towards electric, electrification or electric vehicles. Yeah? Uh, whether we have the infrastructure in place, I think we're going to see a, an emergence. And, and it's not, unfortunately, as, as the innovators next door just said as well, it's not something that you can expect to happen ro overnight. It's a long-term process. But uh, with the electrification, for example, of transport, uh, we'll see the emergence of, for example, utility companies or battery companies and charging operators, uh, recharging operators, as new players in the transport industry. And this is the type of shift that I fully believe is happening at the moment. The question is, how can we support these uh, and, you know, and what, what uh, expanding, if you like, of our horizons do we need to move beyond a corporate perspective, a geographic perspective, or a single transportation line perspective? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Could I, because I fully agree with you, and I think transportation now is owned by transportation companies and not by the whole chain, so that needs to, cha to change. The challenge in how to, to make it work, um, any paradigm shift is difficult, and I think you need to build an infrastructure to support that. And I already mentioned Dynalog, the Institute of Advanced Logistics, this morning, and, and what we're actually attaching to that is what we call the supply chain campus. And the supply chain campus really needs to be the source of innovation of anybody involved in logistics actually based in, a, uh, in one location. So they, they don't just think about their own product, but by a very strong interaction between all these, uh, these brains about logistics, if I can call it that way, you can hope to achieve some paradigm shift. So it's not a matter of just talking about it. Um, I think you need to create the environment, you need to create the institute, and you need to create the supply chain campus to make sure that that's what's going to work. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Zoltan. Um, my name is Marco Sorgetti, and I'm um, the director of ClickUt. We are freight forwarders, logistics service providers, and uh, customs agents at European level. I have a small statement and a question. Uh, the statement is for Mr. Supple. Um, I, I think that your tea bag example wasn't. Um, fitting in my view, because you're trying to, to blur the supply chain, to expand it into areas where it actually pertains not. Uh, that you prepare tea by, by, by boiling water has nothing to do with the supply chain. 
the supply chain stops when actually the tea bag gets into your house, in my view. And if you blur it too much, you would not understand anything about it. The question instead is another one, and it's for Mr. Rosinger. Uh, interesting um, examples you gave us about um, pulling the containers or the boxes away from airports and uh, ports. And this is an idea that has been also um, introduced in some of the projects that have been uh, funded by the European Union, or some of them have not been funded. Um, but there is one big question mark there. We, all, we know all too well that transshipments in the supply chain are a very costly part of it. And by splitting the legs of the supply chain into more minute uh, legs and, and increasing the number of transshipments, you're just adding costs to it. So how do you deal with the cost issue of putting extra transshipment in your supply chain. Wouldn't it be better to just simply manage it electronically in a way that when you pick the box up, it just goes right into the place where it should go and group it together by encouraging um, sort of shared resources? And, um, because we know that transshipment is actually the killing part of intermodality. And by increasing it, I don't think that you're doing a good job. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would fully agree with you. The, the most dangerous point in the supply chain is when you hand over a box from one person to the next. That's the only time when it goes wrong. I mean, it's the strength of the integrators is that they never, they, you know, they keep it themselves. However, if we don't fix that problem, we're going to be moving around all these little packages all in a, in a disorganized way. So I would agree with you that the only way we will make this possible, and it will only happen after we've built a an information system that gives us the true capability of monitoring every shipment at every moment of its time. And from that point of view, and I'm looking at, at, at DHL or I'm looking at any of the integrators, they are able to, to track every shipment every moment and thereby they're able to predict what's happening, they're able to take measures before a problem arises. So the investments that we're now doing are actually all in terms of integrating the information systems and building an information platform that will allow us to take that next step. My guess is that we'll be spending the next two, three years building those information platforms, and not until we have those will we start taking steps to the physical optimization of the flows, because yes, I fully agree with you. Any more questions? Yes. My, my name is Peter Fries from Auto 21 in Canada. I, I with the greatest of respect to my friend on the other side of the aisle, I, I have to say I, I felt that the tea bag example was right on. Uh, that, that really goes to a, a principle known as a total life cycle. And it's, it's important that every process and every product be considered on its total life cycle. Uh, otherwise, you can wind up with completely uh, erroneous analysis of a situation. Uh, I think what it really points out is that those of us who like tea need to find a different way of preparing it. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I really think that uh, the, the whole notion of total life cycle is, is the right way to go. It has to be done responsibly uh, and completely and, and on a common basis, but I think, I think it is the right way to go. Thank you. Declan. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just a statement aside, I mean, uh, uh, from my perspective, it's whether you were looking at, uh, and it's a bit difficult at a transport conference to focus on sustainability in the wider context, yeah? If we're focusing on tr transport optimization, the, the, the criticism is absolutely right on. If we're looking at uh, a paradigm shift and, and looking at sustainability overall, I fully believe that we need to look at the overall life cycle, as Peter says. Any more comments at the moment? Questions? Yes, please. Yes, I, I would like to know, uh, on your, from your point of view, what would be the, the role to play to the shipping companies and, and the air transportation companies in these new uh, ventures, new projects for Schiphol and, and Holland in general, in this integration of information? Thank you. The most important, and I keep saying this, the most important basic requirement is a fully integrated information system. So the very first thing that mainly the shipping companies need to do is to start entering 
And it's funny in logistics, we're still in the Middle Ages. You know, start entering the new era with e-freight, with electronic data exchange. Um, we're so far behind in our industry in terms of, of uh, electronic. I mean, as a passenger, you don't have a ticket anymore. As a, as a box, you generate 36 pieces of paper. I mean, there's something weird about that. So the key thing is for shippers to enter the electronic area and to realize that logistics is a very, very important part of their entire business. For the airlines, the airlines are not as much involved in this, actually, because the airlines, in essence, they transport the goods and providing that the shippers provided the information, that the information is, is being passed through the airline systems into whatever national system or European system they land into, then you have no problem. So the airlines actually have less of a role to play. Uh, the airports have a role to play in that they need to build an infrastructure that allows for a, 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 let's say, more collective management of all the shipments rather than individual management of all the shipments. These are not very complex issues. The real complex issues are ultimately building your inland terminals, multimodal terminals, and to build in Europe a multimodal terminal in a brand new location is a huge challenge. So I think that's in the long term going to be our biggest challenge. Thank you. Now we can move on to the second part of our uh, discussion of today, uh, which deals with uh, another aspect of the supply chain. Uh, the next speakers are going to tackle the issue of what type of policy questions we have to address related to the increase of the efficiency of the supply chain as it is, uh, what ideas uh, their companies are representing, and what type of proposals they have in mind. Uh, the first speaker in this regard is going to be Mr. Stuart Oates, who came from the UK, uh, representing the Freight Transport Association. In fact, he is the president of it. And uh, uh, he will make a comparison between freight and passenger. He will make uh, some comments on charging and tolling policies. And uh, uh, he also wants to address a rather interesting area, which is incentives. So, Stuart. Thank, thank you very much, and good morning. Um, as, uh, uh, as, as we mentioned, um, I represent the Freight Transport Association. Uh, it's the third largest trade body in the UK, um, and clearly we represent freight operators and freight buyers, um, so we speak on behalf of uh, the industry. We engage frequently with, uh, with government, with regulators, to try and uh, make sure that the freight voice is heard uh, in those circles. A little bit of background as far as the UK is concerned. For those of you that are not aware, uh, the UK has signed up to... Uh, some fairly onerous uh, uh, targets as far as carbon reduction is concerned. Um, we're committed to achieving a 34% reduction in the, uh, in the carbon targets from those 1990 levels uh, by 2020 and to an 80% reduction by 2050. So you can see that uh, UK has set some uh, targets somewhat more challenging than perhaps some of the other um, signatories to the Copenhagen uh, Agreement is concerned. Um, the good news, I think, is that um, there's already evidence that we're making good progress. I think we've made something in the region of about a 20% reduction to date from those 1990 levels. Uh, and it's probably fair to say that's despite um, really industry and our members perhaps not getting behind the whole issue of carbon reduction and sustainability until very recently. Um, it's very clear, though, that uh, we are now in a situation where um, our members absolutely are committed to uh, the challenges of, uh, of, of carbon reduction and delivering solutions, introducing solutions that, uh, that can deliver uh, the, the reductions that are required. Uh, and so we've got a very positive environment now within the UK where we're seeing the not just large but also some, some very small niche companies uh, very focused on delivering um, innovation and ensuring that they, uh, they, they meet the targets that, that are likely to be required. Um, the challenge, I guess, for our members at the moment is, 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 is ensuring that there is a, a clear roadmap for them that ensures that their commitments and their investment decisions and their innovations um, 
and not the wrong innovations for, for, the, for the longer term. Um, and of course, businesses need to take some fairly large and fairly significant bets in terms of what they do. So one of the commitments that uh, the Freight Transport Association has, has, has made is to ensure that we try and develop working closely with the Department of Transport and the Department of uh, uh, the Environment uh, and indeed the Treasury. We try and develop something in terms of a roadmap that will help our members understand what initiatives they can take and what are the things that they can do to address their carbon emissions that can, uh, can help them uh, reach the targets that are, that, that are identified. And one of the first steps that we've taken is that we've uh, engaged with government and agreed to introduce a voluntary uh, carbon reporting scheme whereby all, uh, not certainly all of our members as yet, but a, a significant number of our members are committing to report their fuel usage to us. Uh, we'll convert that using government emissions conversion standards to identify the, the, the total uh, carbon uh, footprint of the, of the industry on an annualized basis. And from there onward, we hope to, uh, to work with our uh, colleagues to ensure that we uh, uh, also set improvement standards for each, co each company and for the, uh, for the industry in total on an annualized basis. The, uh, the challenge for us is to make sure that uh, we've got incentives that give, uh, give our um, members the right kind of uh, basis for investing for the future. And, and we're very much of the same voice as, uh, as our colleagues in Holland in the sense that uh, we, we can't continue to do things the way we've done them. Um, and there are many, many very significant opportunities that present themselves if we can take the right decisions in terms of sustainability. So, for example, um, one, of the, uh, one of the key challenges, we, we had a recent meeting where we got uh, 10 of the biggest logistics companies in the UK together. We introduced them to the, to the then Minister of, uh, of Transport. This was prior to our, our government changes. Um, and we, uh, we asked them to each present what, we felt, what they felt were the, ma the most significant areas of opportunity that could drive... Um, Im improvements in, in, in carbon emissions. Uh, and the minister was obviously very receptive to their, to their feedback. Uh, one, of the, one of the key things that uh, people wanted to see was much better opportunity to uh, uh, deliver within an urban environment. Um, there, are, there are key challenges in terms of delivering into city centres. Um, and indeed, one of the things that, uh, that there's a considerable amount of uh, suggestion for is to move to urban consolidation platforms that can eliminate the, the very high number of uh, small vans that are de delivering nowadays in city centres. So there needs to be government investment and government incentivization to ensure that those types of platform can, can be delivered. Um, there needs to be, um, this was a kind of consensus from across the, uh, the board when we spoke to these, these senior representatives from, uh, from industry. Uh, they're, they're desperate to see better access for nighttime deliveries. Uh, again, echoing the issue in, in Holland. Um, frankly, our motorways are congested, our ac access to, to city centres are congested during the, uh, the early and late parts of the, of the day. Um, but night times, we find that the restrictions that give us access to cities uh, are, are onerous. So these are very simple um, initiatives that can give us some very significant gain. Uh, naturally, of course, there are um, other medium-term initiatives that we need to consider, and there's no question that um, if we're going to achieve our 80% reduction by 2050, we need to have uh, much more incentivization from government as far as uh, access to rail is concerned. And the infrastructure and facilities that enable us to switch uh, from... Um, from road to rail and from other modes to, uh, to rail. We need to have the right level of, uh, of access charging such that uh, we've got a competitive playing field for both road and rail. Uh, and indeed, we need to make sure that freight's voice is heard when it comes to creating adequate capacity within the, the rail networks. Uh, today, I'm afraid the passenger uh, voice is 
very loud and very uh, uh, effective. Uh, but there's no question that uh, our economies are completely dependent upon uh, effective movement of freight. Uh, and we need to ensure that uh, despite the high investments that are projected to be made in high-speed rail within the UK, uh, that we also see uh, further significant investment in, in, um, in, in rail freight access. Long term, of course, um, we also need to see governments incentivizing uh, the development of replacement fuels for, for, for carbon. Albeit it's great to see that we are still seeing some, some, some significant progress, and uh, I think it's uh, encouraging just how, uh, uh, how much progress has been made with some of the, uh, the, um, the diesel engines over the course of the last uh, few years. Uh, just, just as a, as a, a final uh, summary, uh, j just to show you the, uh, the kind of work that we're looking at, we, we've identified here quite a complex slide, but just showing you what kind of uh, potential scenarios might exist for delivering the 80% reduction that, uh, that FTA, uh, sorry, that the UK is, is committed to. Um, and we, first of all, of course, have got to be clear about what level of growth we shall see from the 1990 base case that we, we started from. Uh, but you can see that we've, we've modelled both 27% and 65% growth from, uh, uh, from 1990. Um, various opportunities then to, uh, to, to deliver that 80% change, reducing the freight modal split whereby uh, road reduces from 64 to 50%, for example, could be an opportunity. Uh, reducing the empty running that we incur today from 27 to 17%. Uh, improving mean payload to... Uh, 16.1 tons from the 9.8 that we achieve on average across our fleets today. And, of course, we're looking there for government to support longer, heavier vehicles. And, of course, then significant improvements in both fuel efficiency and carbon intensity. So a range of issues that we are looking to uh, encourage government to give us some clear guidance on such that we've got a, a road map that makes sense for our, our members. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Uh, it's an interesting summary and uh, probably will generate certain questions from the audience because uh, there are certain assumptions concerning the scenarios for the year 2050. Uh, of course, uh, 2050 is still uh, quite away from us, so uh, even our uh, grandchildren will be able to con uh, check whether the figures which are indicated here uh, were correct or not. But uh, it can generate certain uh, uh, remarks, and uh, probably some of you who are in the audience uh, work with different figures, so it would be interesting to hear comments from you. Uh, before you make up your mind to ask for the floor, I would pass the floor to our next speaker, who is Petra Kiewit. Uh, she is Executive Vice President of DHL, and she also has some provocative type of comments on uh, how the policies should serve the interests of the private sector. Thank you. Um, due to the time, I try to do it a little bit shorter. Um, hopefully it works. So um, before I talk about my general statements, um, I brought along just a few comments um, on the green task within, on the, uh, regarding the green task within DHL and also my role as um, head of DHL Solutions <coughs> and Innovations. So um, we established this new function, Solutions and Innovation for DHL, one year ago now. It was in August last year in order to bundle the existing innovation functions as well as to, to develop new cross-divisional products and solutions. So from this perspective, it's more a marketing-related topic to develop something new for the three DHL units, which are, as you know, might know, express supply chain and freight forwarding. Um, in terms of our existing innovation functions, we have our innovation center um, in Trostorf, which is close to Bonn, and where we work with the specific testing environment where we work on all these new things, test new technologies, and have all these expert, experts um, who work on, on, on new stuff and new topics. Um, and in terms of the Go Green agenda, um, we act basically as an R&D department as well. So we try to develop new things, alternative technologies um, with our partners, for instance, um, and act as a research partner for our um, go green department to develop um, and do research on new things. 
So besides this, we have a dedicated uh, Go Green department, um, who is in which is in charge of the entire Go Green agenda within our group, Deutsche Post DHL. Um, so my general statements for today are the following. Firstly, um, DHL, Deutsche Post DHL has already a pretty strong commitment to reduce its impact on the uh, environment. As the first major logistics provider, we have ambitious and significant um, targets. Secondly, it's towards the government. The government should untighten some of those regulations in order to ease um, testing and implementation of efficient and innovative technologies. And my third statement is towards the um, technology provider. Um, technology provider needs to show more commitment to energy efficiency as well. And probably one final remark to my, um, my first statement. Um, um, as I said, we are the first major logistics provider with a quantified and group-wide carbon efficiency target, so, which is significant. So um, we aim to improve our own carbon efficiency by 10% by 2012 and by 30% by 2020, which includes the entire DPDHL as well as also our subcontractors. So it means a carbon reduction of 10%, respectively 30% in comparison to 2007. Thank you. Uh, we managed to save some time for that. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, our last speaker in this block is going to be uh, our colleague from, sorry, I have to uh, find the right uh, name for the organization you represent, the World Economic Forum, Mr. Sean Doherty, who uh, I do hope that uh, we will give us some uh, explanation about the uh, activity of this organization as well. But also, I would encourage you to express your opinion on the supply chain matters uh, and probably have to put the emphasis on the latter one. Okay, thank you, Zoltan. <coughs> um, I won't talk about the forum because I'm in competition with Petra now to be as quick as possible. Um, I, what I would uh, draw a couple of learnings from, though, is uh, two projects we've uh, been involved in over the last couple of years, working very much with the leading logistics companies, so DHL, obviously, and, and others. Um, two main ones. One was really a stage-setting uh, project uh, called Supply Chain Decarbonization, which was about drawing you know, what are the perimeters of the problem and trying to give some numerical context to the possible solutions. Um, I very liked the, uh, the comment made earlier about the difference between a paradigm shift and a paradigm adjustment, which is a new term to me. And I think that's what we were trying to do in, in this work, understand what is only a paradigm adjustment and what is actually a potential meaningful solution. And then the specific piece was around uh, consignment level uh, carbon reporting. This is a uh, product or supply chain uh, level of uh, carbon reporting and how DHL can you know, provide that information to their customers and make sure they do so in a comparable way to uh, uh, Deutsche Bahn, UPS, whoever else it may be. Um, so consumers can make empowered uh, choices. Uh, I think there are four interesting learnings which maybe I would uh, highlight today. Um, but before doing that, I should just recognize that uh, uh, you know, vehicle technologies and uh, particularly the spread of those uh, across the world are uh, ultimately you know, crucial for decarbonizing um, transport and supply chains. Um, and I don't want to give the impression that there are you know, clever tricks of the, of the hand which can get away from that, but nonetheless there are you know, significant things you can do just in terms of supply chain optimization. Uh, so first of those, I would actually say, is uh, de-speeding. I think one of the great uh, unsung stories of uh, the last uh, 12 or 15 months is uh, you know, much of the ocean shipping industry has shifted somewhat towards uh, slow steaming. And the, the carbon reduction effect of that is actually fairly significant. Um, ships, I mean, basically, I'm sure somebody will in the audience will correct me, but very approximately the uh, emissions from ships are kind of... Uh, relate to, to the square of the speed. Um, so, you know, just a small reduction in speed has a quite a large uh, effect on emissions. Um, I haven't seen the latest bunker statistics, but I imagine that, uh, you know, quite some savings have been made over the last year. Uh, second point I would make is around packaging. And again, this is something which everybody kind of knows, but not really. Uh, 
is that you can make large reductions through making packaging more efficient. And this is not so much about the, the concept of shipping air where you have bulky packages so you can't fit so much stuff in, but more the fact that making paper and plastic is very carbon intensive, even when you're doing it, as I hope you know, it happens as much as possible with the recycled papers and recycled plastics, it's still actually quite significant in relation to the, uh, um, the emissions from the transport. So logistics operators have, I would suggest, the responsibility to try and work with, uh, on those aspects of uh, what they can do. A uh, third area would be around sourcing locations. Uh, again, I think logistics companies can work very much with their customers to discuss where things are being brought from and to. I'm very sensitive to the argument uh, made earlier about not wanting to shift the blame, if you like, from... Uh, uh, or you know, broaden the, the sphere of inquiry too much. However, I think it is important to at least look at where you're bringing things from and to and whether uh, there are broader savings to be made. I mean, taking you know, the tea bag to the other, uh, other side of the chain, whether you're, making your, uh, you're growing your tea in an efficient way or in an inefficient way can have massive implications. And I think the logistics component of that is actually quite, I mean, or interaction with that is, is quite important. And then a fourth... Uh, uh, point I would make is uh, of these sort of more interesting findings, right? and, uh, ignoring some of the uh, more obvious ones, around home delivery. Um, I'm sure most people are aware that, uh, you know, the fact of if you drive to the supermarket in your SUV, you uh, probably produce quite a few more emissions than uh, most of the goods uh, produced in being shipped to the supermarket. However, I think it's actually, it's much more than that. There was a very interesting paper by Alan McKinnon, a uh, year or two back, pointing out that actually even if you take the uh, public bus to the supermarket, you're still uh, producing more emissions than if a uh, uh, you know, logistics firm efficiently delivered it to your, to your door. Uh, so there are quite some gains to be made in uh, home delivery, actually. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody from P&G in the audience. I saw recently that they are you know, launching uh, their direct-to-consumer sales uh, and I'd be very interested to hear if they have any uh, you know, preliminary thoughts on uh, what the carbon impacts of that would be. Uh, so, I mean, to be quick, overall, I think uh, all of these changes can be driven by life cycle and economic uh, metrics once placed in the hands of the consumer, as uh, Declan was referring to earlier. I think, you know, a little bit we're still in the Soviet model of uh, looking at modes and um, ton kilometers and the like. Uh, and the more work which is done on translating those into economic terms and giving them to the consumer uh, will lead to naturally to many of these things occurring. And I think there will be big opportunities for logistics firms and others to take advantage of some of these uh, uh, solutions. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. It was interesting to hear the reference to the packaging, which uh, was also mentioned by uh, Accenture, in a way, because Declan uh, also referred to the importance of having a proper package, packaging system in place if we want to achieve a good and efficient way of transportation of the goods. And I don't think that it needs further explanation because it is, it is really true. Um, Home delivery, however, is a new element, and uh, this is something which uh, probably we didn't, did not put too much emphasis on so far concerning the uh, transport policy makers who uh, consider it as a residual type of activity much more than a real transport and supply chain uh, activity uh, as it is. Now, uh, the floor is open for comments and questions. So uh, uh, this time you can make comments, you can put questions to the second part of the uh, presenters uh, mainly, but feel free to put questions to the previous part of the uh, morning session as well. Uh, everybody is here and everybody is ready to answer. Uh, Yes, please. Yeah, uh, may um, I ask you to introduce yourself first? Yes, uh, my name is Björn Helmke. I'm from DBZ. It's German trade press on, uh, specialized on transport and logistics. And my question is, uh, Mrs. Kivit, you were quite brief on, on your second topic, uh, uh, to, uh, which was to the government uh, to uh, 
yeah, uh, soften some regulations so that it can be tested. Can you give us some examples where uh, such regulations occur? Yes, of course, I can. So um, just to give you one example, um, if you test um, electric vehicles, they are somehow heavier than the normal combustion uh, engines. And in, in this case, you need a special license, a driver needs a special license because we have this 3.5 tons class, for instance, and then it goes in the, into the next class. So the driver needs a special license, and, and which he normally not, 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 don't, have, so don't have. So um, that's one of the, the obstacles um, from, from the governance side. And the same is for the, um, for the aerodynamical uh, vehicles. If you test um, those vehicles, they tend to be a little bit longer, not heavier, but longer than the normal ones, and that's the same issue. Yes. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I still have another comment. It's about policy, and it's about you know the usual balance of carrot and sticks. Um, we've seen for something like ten years uh, policies applied, at least in the European Union, which is the main, main focus of focus of my uh, attention. Uh, policies that were aimed at um, one way or another creating a modal shift of some sort, and then. Um, they were deployed in various ways. One example is Marco Polo policy, for instance. But if we have to think of that out of the box, and perhaps it could be a, a way of thinking about these things in the future, instead of trying to reward people for what they would have to do anyway, I think we should have to try and think about rewarding them for what they wouldn't do out of their own choice. Um, I give an example, an extreme example, but I mean, it's just to, um, to give you an idea of what I'm thinking. For instance, rewarding road transport operators for disposing of goods instead of giving subsidies to people trying to get the goods. Because I don't think that in, it's right to subsidize people to do what they should do in the first place. It's much better to subsidize them to do what they wouldn't do. And by the same token, if you, if you think of the stick, I think that you should actually inflict penalties to people that do not achieve the results that they should actually achieve. This is how policy would be much more biting than it has been in the last 10 or 15 years, at least in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yes, so the uh, gentleman at the end. Thank you. Uh, Tony May, University of Leeds, England. Um, uh, a comment and a couple of questions, prompted particularly by what Stuart Odes was saying, but also uh, Sean Doherty's comments about um, home delivery. Um, it, it's always struck me that cities have much less, and city transport planners, have much less understanding of freight and logistics than they do of passenger transport. Uh, and therefore, they tend to focus their activities on getting passenger transport right. Um, at the same time, there are real opportunities, and the home delivery example is one, for planning uh, passenger and freight transport together so that each can make an effective contribution, each can have an effective share of the transport infrastructure, each can have, in, in rail terms, consistent access charges. So I'd be interested in the panel's comments on first two real questions. First of all, how can we help cities to understand freight and logistics better and to plan it more effectively? And secondly, is it possible to try to plan freight and passenger transport jointly so that one can get the benefits from the synergies between them? Thank you. Now, it was an interesting question, and I think uh, some of the panelists uh, are in the position of reacting a bit. So probably I would start with you, Stuart. Thank you. Yes, uh, a very interesting question. I think um, certainly FTA would say that one of its key objectives is to try and achieve exactly what you're describing in terms of uh, uh, building stronger relationships with larger cities and ensuring that they understand the impact of... Uh, um, of freight and the, and the opportunities for freight. Um, we've been doing nighttime trials, for example, of, uh, of night deliveries with, uh, in, in collaboration with, uh, uh, with Greater London. So, you know, there's, there's evidence 
there, for example, there's considerable um, interest across some of the UK cities, which you're probably aware of, um, of, the, um, of the potential of, of developing urban consolidation platforms, whereby particular uh, high streets, and we'll talk about Oxford Street and Regent Street, for example, in London, uh, receive all of their deliveries from one consolidated supplier. So basically, uh, uh, a supplier is contracted to deliver all of the product uh, within, within that particular geography. And I think that makes enormous sense. Um, just, a, just a comment on um, home deliveries, uh, which I think is probably worth making. And I would kind of extend it beyond home deliveries to, uh, to kind of what, what we describe in the UK as the white van, uh, the, 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 the small um, uh, goods vehicle. Um, if you look at statistics for London um, over the course of the last two or three years, you will have seen that the number of uh, heavy goods vehicles accessing London has dropped quite considerably outside of purely the recessionary effects that we've, we've faced. But the number of um, transit vans or small vans that are accessing London and making deliveries has actually increased by over 40 or 50 percent. So there's been a significant switch, which I think is... Uh, of great concern to, um, to, to regulators and, and something that, uh, to date, there hasn't been any, anybody looking to try and find a solution to. Now, I would add some of that may be actually down to uh, the development of home delivery, so there may be some substitution as far as uh, the passenger vehicle is concerned, but probably not, not, not an awful lot. Um, and I would kind of, I, I know Alan McKinnon very well, I would probably have a little bit of deba debate with Alan as to whether there really has been much overall benefit as a result of uh, home delivery in the, in, the, in the recent past. Yes, please. Home delivery, an interesting observation on home delivery is that you can look at home delivery in terms of efficiency, in terms of stop people shopping. However, what you find nowadays with many people shopping on the internet, there's a massive increase in home delivery. And as you mentioned, the increased number of vans are of all the various delivery companies who have a tendency to deliver to your home. When you're not there, they deliver a second time. When you're not there, they deliver a third time. And one of the issues in the outer cities, in the suburbs now, is that you have a massive influx of small vans driving around doing deliveries, which is beginning to create not only an environmental, but a safety aspect. So I would agree with the speaker there, uh, the question that it's very important that cities start really thinking about home deliveries, but in a much broader sense than just the bulk deliveries, but in the whole concept of buying behavior by consumers, because if we don't look at that, we're going to end up with a suburban problem uh, rather than just a high street problem. Yeah. So, um, just to add something, we have a perfect solution in place, which is called Packstation, or Pack Station, where you can collect all your stuff which is in the last mile delivery to the households and uh, where we do a kind of consolidation of goods for the last mile. So it's only in Germany available, but it's a good example, I think. Thank you. Now, the floor. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, my name's Henry Posner. I was supposed to be one of the panelists. I was delayed en route. So uh, with your permission, what I'd like to do is take what you're talking about here and include a little bit of what I would like to have talked about but couldn't. Uh, picking up on the theme of uh, truck movements around urban areas, uh, I'm representing the, uh, I guess, the North American rail freight industry. Uh, my passion is to bring some of the institutional innovation which has occurred in North America as opposed to technological. Uh, and I think that one of the things that we have developed is the institutional ability to use relatively low technology rail freight to serve, to, to, to solve transport problems. Uh, unfortunately, that experience is largely undocumented because it's so new and it's mostly folklore. Nonetheless, I think that a lot of that is applicable to Europe. So to the point of trucks moving around urban areas, uh, if, if you look at what happened with rail freight in the last 10 or 20 years, you've seen wagon load traffic, which is supposedly the worst business, but in my opinion is the best business for rail completely disappearing in the UK, and it's in the process of disappearing in France. What is being advanced is, well, we'll just use intermodal. Uh, what that means is uh, using trucks around all the urban areas, 
where the last mile would have been delivered by rail. This is not a green solution. It's not an economic solution. And it also requires enormous capital investment in untested markets. And to the extent that rolling highways, for the most part, I believe, have been a failure in Europe, at least against expectations, uh, I, I wanted to make that point. Uh, one thing I did in all the extra time I had being delayed en route was to uh, look at a particular question, which is, what do you think about green corridors? And I would argue that in the freight business, there is no such thing as a corridor. And if you look at it as a corridor, uh, what you're trying to do is prioritize the carrier as opposed to the customer. Uh, freight is a point-to-point, -point, bottoms up network business as opposed to an engineering or operations driven corridor. So you know, I wish I had more time, but uh, those are the points I'd like to make. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Over there. Uh, my name is Jakub Sjögren from uh, the Swedish Ministry of Transport. First, uh, one word about green corridors. We are deeply involved in green corridors in Sweden, so if you're interested to talk with me afterwards, we can, we can do that. And I also agree with you that uh, a corridor is not, uh, or not uh, a tunnel, it's a network. You need to have doors, uh, otherwise it will be a, 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 a tunnel. Uh, but my question to, to, to the panel, and especially to, to, uh, to Petra Kivit and also to, to Declan Supple is about labeling. Because I think that this is uh, one important issue uh, about the awareness of the, the customers, both the big uh, owners of goods as, as uh, customers, but also the end customers. And my question is, uh, how far from now do you see uh, such a solution when uh, both the big owners of goods and the end customers can make their own choice for the supply chain solution based on costs, but also on the carbon footprint. And for instance, coming to a shop looking for a new dress, you have to look on the label, not only for the cost, but also the lowest carbon footprint. How far from you, five years? 10 years, or what do you foresee? So, which one so uh, maybe I'll start and Petra, you yeah. can okay. complete. Um, so I, I, from, from what I have seen and from what my colleagues have experienced in uh, labeling um, case studies that we've looked at is that we are uh, definitely uh, still at the very beginning of creating the awareness on the side of the consumer and being able, uh, the consumer being able to make a well-founded decision uh, based on the label on the end product. I think, but interestingly enough, the fact that we are having conferences like this, the fact that there is a massive groundswell in the focus of companies to collect data, to uh, understand what or how do I measure my decarbonization efforts? How do I uh, agree on a standard, whether it's in a particular industry, whether it's a, a, a transport industry focus or a focus from a retail industry point of view or a geographic or a national point of view? The, this discussion is very active at the moment. Personally, I think that we are still quite a way away from a, um, a across the board, uh, effectively a global standard basically that can be used across different um, consumer uh, sectors uh, for an advised and well-informed decision to be taken. But I think that the movement is definitely there. I would, personally, I, I don't know if you can put a time frame on this, but I think we're talking at least five years before we get to a, a well-founded decision. Yeah, uh, nothing to add. So I think it's uh, it's a question of a of a standard of a, to having have a global standard. That's uh, that's the most difficult point I think or issue I think. So I think it's a couple of years away to answer your question directly. Uh, at the end, there is a gentleman over there. Thank you. My name is Jens Hügel from the International Road Transport Union. I'm having seen a modular concept truck in front of the exhibition and having uh, listened carefully to Ms. Kivita, uh, Mr. Oates, I was wondering if these two speakers uh, could share their views on how the modular concept could help to make the supply chain more green and more efficient and if a standardized version of this modular concept uh, would help multimodal transport. Thank you. Did you refer to the two last speakers? Sorry, to Mr. Oates and to Ms. Kivit. Okay. 
Um, well, first of all, I haven't had a chance to have a look at the truck. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing it later on during the, uh, during the conference. Um, there's no question that um, road freight is going to continue to be the dominant uh, uh, freight mode for the, the foreseeable future. Um, I've got every um, respect for our rail industry, and I hope it will make... Uh, big strides over the course of the next uh, few years within the UK and indeed across Europe. Um, it's, it's one of the, I think, the biggest concerns most people within the UK would have today, that we really don't have the capacity or the access uh, to, to give us um, a competitive uh, and level playing field. Um, but of course, um, that final point-to-point -point, uh, solution is always going to be delivered by by road, so uh, rail may have a, 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 a part to play in the, in the kind of long haul, but actually in the final mile, road is very, very, very important. Um, and so, making sure that we've got the best, most efficient solutions as far as roads concerned is uh, is critical. And vehicle design is uh, is obviously an important part of that, as is obviously all the uh, all the developments that are in essential as far as um, um, load sharing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I'm sure um, there'll be a lot of people looking to see the, uh, uh, the truck outside and very keen to, uh, to understand what uh, initiatives are being introduced. And, and most definitely one of the things that uh, we will also be campaigning for within the Freight Transport Association is to, uh, to introduce the longer, heavier vehicle. That's very much part of our uh, overall uh, policy objective. Um, and uh, we've got... British government, I think, starting to be receptive to longer vehicles. Uh, there's a very wide kind of uh, concern across the British public about the principle of, of heavier vehicles on the road. Uh, and I think we have to work as an industry to make sure that we convey the improved safety that we're achieving because, you know, the road sector is achieving enormous strides, not just in terms of efficiency, but also in terms of, uh, of safety as well. So that, I think, is... An, an important agenda for us to uh, to address. Uh, yeah. uh, Michael Robson, European Rail Infrastructure Managers. Um, a couple of points. The, the capacity for freight, I agree, is a key issue. Uh, and one of the things that we continually struggle with is um, there's a lot of pressure to build new high-speed lines, which we fully support. The logic is that you then release capacity on the traditional network. Um, and the logic following that was you would use it for free. But we're now in a competing mode because around a lot of cities and a lot of regions, they want to run more passenger services. And what we are finding is in a number of countries, there is no joined up thinking as to what the transport plan should be. Uh, and I think that if one of the messages I can give is that something that each country needs to have a view as to what its infrastructure is there to deliver. And you can't have both. Uh, in some places you can, but in a lot of places where you want to have both are the very places where your infrastructure is congested. So that was my, my first point. Um, my second point was the, was the point uh, Stuart made about access charges. Um, and it's a long debate on access charges, but the point that you didn't make was that the UK is one of the countries that actually has reduced its rail freight charges in an effort to stimulate more traffic on rail. And that's one of the areas I think we need to think about, as you quite rightly said, about how we stimulate traffic moving uh, onto rail. But there's an example of a country that has actually done that. Uh, thank you. I did not take it as a question because it was uh, much more as a remark. Um, yes, you over there. Uh, so, uh, referring back to this paradigm shift again, um, I think it's good enough to say uh, and to integrate the um, carbon footprint into the pricing of transport services. But I think, referring back to the paradigm shift, it's, it's not enough. Because then we, I think we need to in, in integrate the whole external cost. It doesn't tell the whole story just to include carbon footprint. I mean, it's one part, but it's not all. So I think it's really important um, as well to include all the external costs, starting from land take to, I don't know, noise pollution, air pollution, all that sort of things, uh, into the, the price of a transport service in the near coming future. Thank you. 
Thank you. Anybody wants to comment? No? I would agree with that. I, let me give you an example. Uh, Holland is very famous for flowers and growing, and uh, traditionally roses are grown in greenhouses in Holland. Nowadays, the bulk of the roses are actually grown in Kenya, Tanzania, uh, 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 in, in countries where they have a tropical climate. Because they're then flown to Europe, they are then in some uh, supermarkets uh, uh, being marked as flown in and therefore having a high uh, 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 footprint. The reality is that actually the energy consumed by using the greenhouses far exceeds whatever is being used by flying them from Africa to the Netherlands. So if you do not look at it in an integrated sense, you could make the wrong decision and work on the assumption that roses from Africa are worse for the environment than roses from the Netherlands, from a greenhouse, whereas actually they could either be the same or it might be the other way around. So that's an example that I agree with you. Yes. Thanks. I I'd just like to develop on that a little bit and refer back to some of the other points. Because um, I think one of the difficulties is obviously that it's very difficult to integrate all this information. And then even if you're able to do that, you know, at some kind of rough level, how much attention does the consumer pay to it? I mean, when I go and buy some flowers, you know, I may be the best intentions in the world, but I'm probably going to buy the ones which look fresh and happen to be sitting there. Or equally, you know, my wife, she's going around and she's buying pampers for my kids and that kind of stuff. And she drives in the car and all that, but how can you make this, some of these things work in practice? And one of the potential advantages of some of this direct-to-consumer work and home delivery and the like, as, and I accept uh, some of the reservations, is that A, consumers start to make longer-term and better-informed decisions. So, for example, if instead of going fairly randomly into a shop and picking up my pampers, I instead get into the habit or some people get into the habit of making their order for them so that once every two weeks you know some delivery truck comes by and drops off the pampers and the milk and the flowers that i like to have appeared once a week now probably that's great for the the retailer because once i've made that order then i'm extremely unlikely to change it that much i mean much as like you don't change your bank on a weekly basis um but you also you probably put a little bit more thought into the decision as to to what you're buying and i may you know, probably I'll make sure to look through and see that actually I'm getting something which is a good deal for me. It's quite cheap. But I may look at some of these other considerations as well, which I wouldn't do if I was just randomly picking something off a, a supermarket shelf. What, one other, you know, benefit which comes from this new world is, for example, I mean, going back onto the packaging. A lot of packaging exists, to be frank, for advertising purposes. And, you know, you have these big glossy packages. If you're buying something on the Internet, okay, you have a great, nice-looking Internet screen. But the product, when it arrives, can be in a simple uh, plastic package, and maybe you can get rid of some packaging. So to get towards your paradigm shift, to get towards, uh, you know, to start integrating some of this information, it will happen. It's difficult. But as these things add up little by little, um, hopefully some of the, uh, the changes can be cumulative. Thank you. It takes us back to the old uh, theoretical question of whether the transport is, can be considered too cheap or not. The cost of the transport is always having a serious impact on, on the performance of the uh, sector and, of course, uh, on the uh, demands uh, coming from the customers. So uh, uh, when we talk about uh, supply chain, we also have to bear in mind that uh, this issue is still there and nobody could solve it so far. Uh, we still have a time for one more question. We... <laughs> It's not going to be easy. To... Uh, the lady with the microphone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Nina Renshaw from T&E Transport and Environment. My question follows on from that last point very much so. Um, we certainly take our hats off to the companies that are already implementing trials with their own targets, with labelling, um, uh, with footprinting, for example, but we've heard that's going to be a long time. Um, and this being a transport forum, we'd like to kind of narrow the focus to the transport part of the supply chain, of course, my question to the panel would be, is a price signal, whether that comes from fuel taxation for the carbon part or whether that comes from infrastructure charging, distance-based charging across all modes for the other external effects, is that likely to be simpler? Is that likely to be quicker? Is that likely to be more effective? That's my question. And in response to the uh, very large truck we have outside, I think people should make up their own minds as regards to whether they think these vehicles can possibly be safe on our roads. Um, but secondly, you know, necessarily, 
these vehicles can't be branded as greener because they send the price signals in precisely the wrong direction. And I wonder how the panel would react to that. Thank you very much for this question. This is exactly that type of question on which we used to organize conferences for days. <laughs> so it's uh, not going to be easy to react on it, but if uh, someone has the courage to, to make some comment uh, in the panel, then feel free. It's always difficult to, to, to prove the effect of price or, or taxes or whatever on, on transport, but one move that I see that there used to, or there is still an enormous amount of outsourcing of manufacturing from Europe to, uh, uh, to Asia, uh, China, now Vietnam, etc. With the increase of fuel price, with the increase of transportation cost, that's one of the elements. Reliability was another. But with the increase of transportation cost, what we see is that more and more companies are, are actually now moving their production to Eastern Europe rather than Asia. Because by having their production in Eastern Europe, their dependence on transportation costs, given the fact that their largest market is probably Germany and part of Eastern Europe anyway, they are actually reducing their transportation costs. So what you could say is that price has, is one of the factors, not the only one, but is a factor that helps decision making in some companies. Now, whether you should now start playing with that tool in terms of technation or whatever, that I would scare away from, but it, it, there's no doubt that price of transportation does have an impact on the choices that people make in where they put their production. Stuart. Uh, sorry. No. Stuart. Yeah. Well, I would add that um, We've seen quite a uh, progressive uh, focus on fuel taxation in the UK over the course of the last uh, few years, as, as, uh, as I think most European countries have. Um, I would say that that's certainly starting to drive um, a number of companies within the UK to consider using rail. So there has been some impact, I think, from, uh, from taxation. Uh, the statement that I wanted to make was um, introducing the pricing element as well into your supply chain design decisions is one of the many different elements I think that we're facing in the area of supply chain management in general at the moment. So yes, there's a move east, there's a manufacturing move towards uh, Asian countries, also to Eastern European. The configuration of a supply chain now is far more complex today than it was 10, 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, to come back to the statement that was made before about whether we see logistics managers on the boards of any companies, I think that is still definitely an area that uh, is lacking the level of management attention that, it, that is required, but one which we're beginning to see, though, more and more. So the observations that we've been making is that supply chain is gradually making it up to the board level and that the complexity that is being faced by this whole area is definitely being recognized. Uh, the demands of the customers on uh, manufacturing corporations as well are far more complex and they're differentiated and the regulatory requirements and the uh, national situations the company face are also very different so the complexity of uh, putting together a configuration of your supply chain involving procurement processes manufacturing process and sales and marketing processes is uh, something which I think is definitely getting a place at the management table today well uh, I'm sorry to say that this was the last statement from our side. Uh, simply, we, uh, we were running out of time, and I really appreciated the activity of those who participated from the audience in the discussion and who put questions, sometimes provoking uh, the panelists who liked this type of provocation. And uh, it uh, reinforced my impression that the supply chain issue is not really a simple issue which is easy to be solved. Supply chain covers economical factors, it covers social factors. We did not talk too much about the social implications of the supply chain activities yet. Uh, it also involves environmental uh, issues and environmental uh, approaches. Uh, we try, the Secretariat of uh, uh, FJI is going to put together a summary of the discussions what we had today and this is going to be available on the website if I am not mistaken Mr. Volian. Okay. 
in a couple of days' time. So uh, I will encourage you to uh, go for the website of the Secretariat and uh, you will see all the points which were raised today by all the panelists and the audience. I thank you for the panelists for their activities, for, readiness, for their readiness to participate in this discussion, and I also thank you for your active participation in the debate. I hope it is going to have a good milestone for the, the support of the, or the promotion of the supply chain issues in the future. Thank you.